welcome back everyone so moving on to our last lecture of the session so let's let me introduce professor rama govinda rajan from icts and she'll be talking about active caustics over to you thanks rashmi and uh, thanks to ranjini and mahesh for this opportunity so we're going to be talking about active caustics we'll see what that means so uh, first of all like if i have a turbulent flow and i have that's a bit too is it too loud oh. okay uh, so if i have a turbulent flow and we have particles in that flow that's the situation we're going to be talking about today so in that situation if these pa particles are just passive particles namely they just tracers moving everywhere with the flow then they won't particularly cluster anywhere that's like intuitive there will be particles everywhere and if you put them with a uniform number density they will always have a uniform number density even at the end so that is uh, pretty simple we're going to talk about two kinds of particles which cluster so the first is inertial particles and the second is active particles and we will compare and contrast these things as we go along so what is an inertial particle we will see that but basically tiny raindrops can be thought of as inertial particles because raindrops are in a cloud which is basically air and so they don't passively follow the flow they do many other things apart from passively follow the flow and the simple summary is that if you have no turbulence you will not have rain so that is pretty well accepted now and so in order to get rain you need lots and lots of little droplets to come together cluster and uh, coalesce and then make bigger droplets and this is uh, important for rain formation so uh, in inertia uh, this kind of unmixing or clustering that turbulence gives becomes very important and secondly Uh, by the way i wanted to show rain as a positive thing but i just put this photo uh the other situation is entirely different and it's kind of more unexpected and we will try to get a, a basic feel for this this is where activity is important for producing clustering so and this is important for many things like plankton plankton need to socialize they need to reproduce so they need to come closer to each other and not be randomly distributed in a dilute suspension so there's important reasons for clustering and we will talk about that so we are going to be living in a situation where there is a big turbulent flow like such as in a cloud or in the ocean these are the two examples of course there are many many more examples of particulate flows there are you know um, uh, dust particles coming out of a volcano there's pollutant dispersal there's so many situations in which things like this can be important but we just to pin our thoughts down we're going to take clouds and we're going to take plankton at the other end and in clouds water droplets are way way, way heavier than air and in the ocean plankton are living things which are not way 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 heavier they just ever so slightly heavier or could even be lighter than the water they are living in so so those are the two limits we are going to be talking about and in all of these our flow is very very big so the reynolds number based on the flow is very very high so in cloud it's not at all unusual to have you know extremely big like 100 million is also not unknown so we uh, will solve the navier we are not going to solve it today uh, the big navier stokes with big reynolds but we'll see what we'll do so the flow is described by the navier stokes equation which everybody here is familiar with and we're living in the incompressible limit so then we are throwing a large number of particles in this flow okay what's happening to the particles so for the particles we will write the velocity of the particle as v the flow velocity as u and we will look at the equation which describes their difference and in this thing in the particulate flow what happens is that the reynolds number which is based on this difference a typical scale based on this difference times the particle radius a little radius and the kinematic viscosity nu is much 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 less than 1 so we are in the limit where reynolds number of the flow is much much bigger than 1 reynolds number of the particle is much much smaller than 1 and now when it's very much smaller than 1 you can actually throw away this nonlinear term 
Okay, you throw away this nonlinear term and suppose, and this is a different non-dimensional number, it's called the Stokes number. It's going to be very important in our talk today. So the Stokes number is the ratio of the particle time scale, the response time of the particle compared to the flow time scale. So this could be significant, may or may not be significant. And whenever it is significant, we are in unsteady Stokes flow and otherwise we are in steady Stokes flow. So we're going to be talking about both these situations today. For the inertial particles, you'll be living in unsteady Stokes flow. And there it's easy to see how clustering occurs. But if you're in steady Stokes flow, then how can clustering occur? That's what we're going to try and explain today. So this is the two cases we'll talk about. In the steady Stokes, we'll be talking in the uh, about active particles. And this is when there's a significant Stokes, we call them inertial particles. And uh, uh, yeah, so these are particles in living in a turbulence where the flow velocity is u, the particle velocity is v. Okay, so now, as we said, we're in high Reynolds number for the background flow, Stokes flow for the particles. Now, let's, for the remainder of this talk, we'll consider all particles to be spheres. And if you have teeny tiny spheres, interspersed in turbulence, these spheres are going to obey the maxi riley equation. The maxi riley equation is nothing except an unsteady Stokes equation written for a spherical particle with that spherical particle in mind. So this V now represents the velocity of one particle. And d by dt it's, is its acceleration when you're moving in its frame. And then everything is with respect to that particle. So this is what the maxi riley equation looks like. This is a Stokes drag V minus U. And uh, the Stokes number, which we described, comes in the denominator. There is a density ratio, a non-dimensional number called G, which comes in the numerator here. So this is a very simple equation. This thing has to do with the fluid acceleration. And this has to do with the Stokes drag. So this is the equation where we write dV by dt, the acceleration of the particle, which we are not neglecting equal to all of this. Note that this thing looks linear, but it's highly nonlinear. It looks as if we threw away the nonlinear term in the Navier-Stokes, right? However, this u is evaluated at this point x where the particle is. So that makes this system highly nonlinear. And that's the maxi riley simplified one. If we have time at the end, we'll mention this bassett business history. But right now, we're neglecting it. So first, let's define caustics, which is half of the title today. So suppose we could consider all these particles in a bunch, all nearby particles in a bunch. And suppose we could give them a characteristic velocity u. So suppose all of them are kind of moving together with the characteristic velocity u, which may be different from the fluid velocity, uh, characteristic velocity v, which is different from the fluid velocity u. So in other words, we're giving these particles a slip velocity. So suppose you could do that, like consider them in a bunch. Then, and then we're actually pretending that these particles are in a field. So we're writing a field equation for v, as opposed to the previous maxi Riley where you saw I'm writing for each particle about its velocity. So that's the difference when we think of it as a field. Now let's think of it as a field for a little while. So in this field, we said that the background flow is incompressible, but del dot V, which is the particle divergence, is not zero. This is because particles can cluster or particles can go everywhere. So this is not zero. That's very important. And caustics is a location where this quantity actually goes to minus infinity. So the divergence diverges. So you can think of caustics being defined as that where the divergence of the flow diverges. It looks very complicated, but it's actually very easy. A caustics event is just one where two particles are dashing against each other. So we said we are pretending that this thing is a field, right? So at every given x, y, and z and time, there is a V. However, if two particles come and dash against each other, then it, these are point-like particles. So at the exact same, same place and time, you have two Vs. And that's equal to the divergence diverging. So it's as simple as that. So in caustic regions, we cannot consider the particles as being in a field. Uh, yes. Why it tends to minus infinity? That I didn't understand. Okay. So yeah. basically, uh, 
imagine that a whole bunch of particles are coming together in one point. So something which was occupying a volume is now occupying zero volume. So the divergence is minus infinity. You can work that out quite easily. Other questions? Okay. So caustics are there everywhere. We've seen them in swimming pools. They're there in gravity in big galactic clusters. And this is the case of a particulate suspension that we are going to talk about. Basically, they are singular features. They are where lots and lots of particles have come into practically zero volume, like we were saying, right? So this is caustics. Okay, so then when we look in a turbulent flow, the idea is to hunt for caustics regions. The idea is to hunt for regions where we cannot write V as a field. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. And uh, these caustics things are well known when you think of, you know, big particles coming out of two vortices. So whenever there's a vortex in turbulence and another one, these two particles are centrifuged out rapidly and they come and dash against each other. So that is like pretty uh, well known that that can happen. What we were looking for is what happens near one single vortex. And that's what we're going to devote a lot of time on today. So what happens near one vortex? Can you have caustics? So here is my vortex. And here is an inner ring made of pink particles. Here is an outer ring made of black particles. So can the inner ring overtake the outer ring? That would define for us a caustics near a single vortex. Yeah, so that's what we're going to be looking for today. So in turbulence, I told you that particles cluster and they kind of demix. So this is an example of a movie made by Jason. So uh, what he showed is that the vortex regions get voided of particles. So particles, these are heavy particles, they get centrifuged out of vortices. So this keeps happening in turbulence and he's colored them differently according to how poorly they follow the fluid flow. So we are going to be asking about single particle caustics near a vortex. I mean, particle caustics near a single vortex. Okay, so just a little bit to describe why we are looking at single vortices. We know that turbulent flow is made up of lots of vortices, right? And these vortices are in all kinds of shapes and sizes. They have all levels of circulation, a whole range of circulations. And these things, they keep telling each other how to move. They keep, by the Biosava law, they tell everybody else how to move. And they keep dying, they keep being born, they keep stretching, lots of things are happening to them. And so like, the idea is if we understand particles near a single vortex, we're going to understand something about particles in turbulence. So this is the basic idea to bring it down to the drosophila, the basic simplest thing you can do. So here, what we'd like to define as the drosophila, oops, what have I done? Okay, uh, the drosophila of turbulence is a lambocene uh, vortex. A lambocene vortex basically is a vortex with a Gaussian profile of vorticity. And all vortices in turbulence try to become lambocene. So this was like a thing with Prasad. Prasad, I think, is in the room. Oh, Prasad vanished. But this is work with Prasad, where we showed that you can take any vortex in this 2D turbulence, and these are actually like from the simulations. They all try to become Gaussian. This is well known that they will try to become Gaussian, but uh, you can actually show that. And as the thickness delta of this vortex keeps becoming smaller and smaller, we can treat it as a point vortex. So we're going to treat every, I mean, we're going to understand everything in a point vortex where it's basically a delta function of vorticity at one place. Everywhere else is not vertical, but the fluid particles are going round and round uh, with a u theta, an azimuthal velocity equal to its circulation divided by 2 pi r. So as the radius r, the distance away from that point vortex becomes bigger and bigger, they go around slower and slower. So this is all that fluid particles do. So this is just an idealized drosophila of turbulence that we're going to take. And now we're going to write down the Maxi-Riley equations for each small particle in that flow. 
and uh, this is Kroor, who is my former student and who's now a, a faculty member in IIT Bombay. So he came up with this really nice uh, length scale to non-dimensionalize everything by. This is the particle time scale tau times the vortex circulation gamma. And the square root of that makes a length scale. You write the Maxi Riley, write it in r theta coordinates, cylindrical coordinates, and you non-dimensionalize it using tau as the time scale and L as the length scale. You get this very cute, easy set of equations, two equations. And very quickly in a particle time scale itself, zeta will become one because zeta dot is one minus zeta. It very quickly relaxes to one. So then I can replace this as one here, and this is a very, very easy equation. Now, the nice thing is this is the equation for every powerful vortex of any strength and particles of any Stokes number. Everything fell out. It's completely parameter free. And these are universal equations for any point vortex. So now with these equations, and the thing is, if I solve it once for one vortex, I've done it for all the vortices and all the particles, so long as they are in unsteady strokes and so on. So long as those conditions are fulfilled, this is the equation for inertial particles. And now, like, this is such an easy thing to solve, and we can just solve this for these two rings. And if the delta R, that means the initial R0 is the initial location, if the delta R0 between pink and black changes sign, then I know caustics has been formed. Okay? Now, when we do that, when we solve those simple equations, and we just ask, we put two rings, and we ask, when does the inner ring cross the outer ring? And that we call the time of caustics. And this is the initial radius R0. And you will see that with varying initial conditions, the caustics time keeps increasing as the radius keeps increasing. And beautifully at this point around 0 0.55, the caustics time just diverges. So inside this radius, whoever starts life inside this radius, near a vortex can form caustics, can participate in caustics, and whoever is lying outside this radius can never ever form caustics. So even if they wait for infinite time, they will not form caustics. So this is the central message in this part, which is that there is a special radius, which is order one in our special length scale. And inside that special radius, Particles have a chance of becoming participating in caustics. Outside that special radius, they do not. And inside the special radius, it's not a field. Outside the special radius, you can write equations, field equations. Okay, and now, like as you run this thing in time for various R naughts, various initial conditions, you see like the number density of particles diverging at some place, not diverging, but becoming very high because we started out with finite number of particles. And this peak keeps, you know, slowly gravitating outwards. It's a it's slowly centrifuging outwards. So that's what happens. And we're able to get the particle number density exactly by this very nice method where you can sit on one particle and ask about its number density. So I don't have to solve for very large number of particles, but I can actually get the answer. And we are seeing clearly that the character of this changes at R around one. And all of this indicates to us that this is a singular perturbation problem. And we'll see what that is right here. So basically, a singular perturbation problem is when if you have something like that, plus one equal to plus x equal to zero, some equation like this, and a very, very small number epsilon is multiplying the very, very big, the highest derivative, then like somewhere or other, this term starts becoming important because you have to satisfy two boundary conditions. So that is what a singular perturbation problem primarily is. And when this happens, you can solve for an inner flow, which is very close to one of the boundaries and an outer flow, which is far away from that boundary. And the outer flow becomes very simple. You can just write it like this and solve it. So that's exactly what our equation here is. This equation, r double dot plus r dot is one by r cube, something like that. This thing is multiplied by an epsilon, a hidden epsilon. We scaled it out, but it is. So now, 
in the region where r is very very small that means particles are very close to the vortex we can write an inner solution which is very easy to solve and we can show that particles uh, caustics form within particle time scale this is just a confirmation of what we have in the numerics but it's nice to write down analytically and outside you only get slow centrifuging and uh, in and every particle uh, executes what we call a fermat spiral so then we solve this as a singular perturbation problem like i told you we in the inner layer we get this solution and so this solution tells me two things one is that the vicinity of the vortex is evacuated very fast on particle time scale so to give you an idea like in the cloud like 10 micron particles have a time scale of 2 milliseconds whereas the big eddies can have like many like even minutes as their time scale and tiniest eddies kolmogorov eddies have 0.1 second as their time scale so these things are way way faster than the kolmogorov time scale which is the typical small scale in turbulence okay so then uh, and also that delta r0 when two particles start near changes sign at this time when they are neighboring particles and in the outer layer like i said it's like you know you have a slow compression compressibility but nothing else happens like nobody crosses nobody and why is all this important we'll see that here so what we do is we now asking about raindrops like how raindrops form so like what we did is we started with a little lambocene vortex there shown by the black circle we put green particles inside the caustic's radius and we put red particles outside the caustic's radius and every time two particles collide and they coalesce so with some probability they coalesce and we are going to color the coalesced big drops navy blue and we will ask oh wait we'll color the big drops navy blue only if they have some green blood in them only if some caustic particle has participated in this particle and if red collides with red then becomes a big drop it will still be a big red drop so that's what we do and we run the simulation you can see that so you see the rapid evacuation you see the bigger drops coming up who are colored navy blue now the interesting thing is almost every big drop has become navy blue namely whoever was not a caustic drop to start with had practically zero chance of becoming a rain drop even these are not rain drops they just bigger droplets so you started with 10 microns now they become 20 microns or something and these guys can then it follows a rich get richer algorithm and these big drops have a much better chance of becoming a rain drop so just to give you a sense of this we starting with 10 micron drops and uh, a rain drop is about a millimeter right order of a millimeter you need 1 million coalescences to make every single rain drop it's kind of mind boggling when you think about it so actually 1 million coalescences and these big guys have a much better chance of making it i'm going to skip this okay so now we can take this further we have solved this for one vortex we can we know the distribution of vorticity in turbulence we know how it is in a turbulence given a reynolds number in homogeneous isotropic turbulence we can use our knowledge namely other people's simulations and we can ask what is the fraction of voids that are formed and we know the voids are of order gamma tau to the half where gamma the distribution of gamma the vorticity uh, circulation comes from uh, the turbulence data so then we can ask who among these vortices can have a void which particles can create a void and if uh, among these void regions what is the probability of coalescence and uh, things like that so we can make some uh, um, you know back of the envelope estimates and we can come up with a reynolds number of about a million below which a cloud cannot rain above which also it may not rain but yeah it's of that order so then like all this was about very heavy particles remember when we started we said we'll talk about very heavy particles as well as hey what's this time it's showing how much time do i have left half an hour okay oh i should look at that huh. okay so um we now talk about particles that are not that heavy because like uh, plankton are not that heavy there are other things 
that are not that heavy, which we may want to learn about. And this G quantity is that density ratio we talked about. And when G is equal to one, then particles are infinitely heavy compared to the fluid. When G is equal to two by three, particles are the exact same density as the fluid. So that's how this parameter goes. So it goes from uh, two thirds to one for heavy particles and less than two thirds for lighter particles. So like when you write down this uh, outer flow equation, you see this Fermat spiral equation with the G into it. You see that when the particle is lighter than the fluid, it's got an R dot less than zero, namely it's going towards the center of the vortex. So a simple thing to remember is bubbles go to the center of vortices. Whereas heavy particles leave the vortex. If they're even slightly heavier than the fluid, they will centrifuge out. So let's get back to the Maxi Rayleigh equation. This time talking about not so heavy particles where G is going somewhere between two thirds and one, but it's not one. And this is work by Rajarshi, who is there, last row. Okay, so then, um, yeah, so these are now the Maxi Riley equations. We've written them down before. We've looked at these two non dimensional numbers before. But now we are going to treat it as a field instead of treating it as individual particles and ask by looking at it as a field, can we detect where the divergence diverges? Can we write down an equation that we can solve and ask about caustic's regions everywhere in the flow? So this is the generalization we'd like to make. So uh, Rajeshi defines these two quantities, uh, this A equal to Stokes number times grad U, where U is the flow velocity field, and Z is equal to Stokes number times grad V, where V is the particle velocity field. So A and Z are uh, two uh, things which look very similar, but are going to be different. And now he derived this equation for a, a uh, particle which is not so heavy. Uh, other people, Prasad and Maibom, they had derived, and, and even earlier than that, people had derived such an equation for heavy particles. So this is a generalization to arbitrary densities that other people had derived before. And now, like, we can just write down this equation for this quantity Z, when you have a, a field for V, and then you ask, when does the trace of Z go to minus infinity? The trace of Z is just the divergence of V, as you can see. And it turns out that if this equation has fixed points, namely dz by dt goes to zero and this thing actually reaches a steady state, then it will never diverge. But whenever it does not have fixed points, it always diverges. So you can spend some time convincing yourself of that if you like, but right now you can trust us that Whenever there's no fixed point, you basically reach caustics. So the absence of fixed points is for us caustics. And you can calculate the same thing that we did. Remember this curve which diverged the caustics time and the caustics radius. So this caustics time is now diverging. So this was for the heavy particle. And now we put lighter and lighter particles. You see that there is a, I mean, kind of, a trend and you can make these curves collapse. We won't go into that now. And uh, the radius at which the caustics happen also follows something similar, except that it diverges earlier and earlier for a lighter and lighter particle. There's one other difference, which is that here we solve a kind of different equation. We solve this analytically. We solve a kind of different equation where we uh, just look at a Z associated with a place rather than with a particle. So if you move with the particle, you always have a Z, which is descriptive of its field. But then like, suppose you don't do that, you sit in one place, then you can actually get an analytical answer. And for different Gs, this is what you get. G equal to one was the old answer, which gave us that critical caustics radius of 0 0.55. 0 0.55 now became 1.4 because uh, Rajashi multiplied everything that Kruur did by root two pi, right? So that's what happened. So then, uh, whereas for the lighter particles, there's also an inner region. So the caustics region becomes an annulus, not a circle. So this is a nice thing. So what we've come across here is like, 
Whenever you have inertia, you get caustics somewhere near the vortex, and no inertia means no caustics. In other words, like if G was two by three, there would be no caustics. That's one way in which you don't get inertia when particles become tracers. Why did it become a ring? So uh, what happens is that particles inside here, so this is a different analytical calculation where you don't allow particles from here to move. You're sitting with the particle trapped there and you're asking whether Z can become minus infinity. And it cannot, whereas in this annulus it can, only in this annulus it can. However, when you start out a particle here, it can move out, right? A regular particle can move out and it can form caustics inside that annulus. Exactly. It's just an Eulerian answer for the Z. Whereas, uh, so, so in other words, hmm? yeah, the other one was Lagrangian. So in other words, this quantity A is held constant in the one case and changes in the other case as the particle explodes. Oops, what have I done? Okay. So now we come to active particles. So we've now looked at what happens when you have an inertial particle, which leads to caustics under certain conditions. And we've only looked at that for a uh, single vortex, but we will quickly see a simulation later on. Now, what happens when you do not have inertia? So like this was the equation we looked at. And we said the Stokes number for inertial particles was significant, right? So we were sitting with non-zero Stokes number and we were getting caustics. Now for these active particles that we're going to be talking about, there is no inertia, so Stokes is zero. So because Stokes is zero, that term goes away, that term goes away, and you're left with the steady Stokes equation. So like everything in your uh, thinking tells you that they cannot be caustics because remember in this singular perturbation problem, this thing was X double dot, which for us was R double dot, namely the acceleration in the radial direction. If that thing goes to zero, namely Stokes goes to zero, so that term drops out. Unless you have differing accelerations, how can you have caustics? That's the point, right? Like if the velocity only depends on the location, then obviously you cannot have caustics. They will just follow whatever they're doing. They might come closer, but they'll never form caustics. We're going to see how that happens in this situation. Now, the difference here is the following. So like earlier we had V minus U was basically Stokes drag and some other terms, right? Whereas here we have V minus U is this activity term and plus some external forces, if you like. So what does this activity term tell you and what is it doing? Let's look at that. So this is work by Rahul, who actually hasn't slept for two nights because uh, what he gave me the answers just before I walked in here. So he is right now in Stanford, so it's night for him. So yeah, uh, this equation has this forcing thing W. It has an external force W. And what is that force? Let's think about it this way. Here's my vortex. We're still going to think about my vortex. And the vortex has these U circular streamlines going around it. The particle is at a distance X as before from the vortex. And we're taking the centroid of the particle as denoting the distance for denoting the distance X. Okay. Now we can think of it as a dimer. We think of this particle no longer as a sphere, but as a dimer. Okay. And what does this dimer do? Let's go over that. So this dimer, we can think of it like in a very trivial way as a thing, a spring, two blobs connected by a spring. Okay. And what will happen to this spring? So normally, if you write down a simple linear spring equation, you'd write down something like this, right? Except that this spring has flow coupling. So it's going to respond to how the flow is. So this is basically the standard spring equation, except that this MW, I wanted to put a cross around it and forgot. So yeah, this term is no longer there. These are not inertial. So the, the mass is not there for this spring. So this is a massless spring and that term has to go away. 
Okay, so we have to write the rest of the equation here, W dot minus KW plus flow coupling, and that's what we write down here. So W dot and the gamma has been divided out here to get a response time for the W. So what is this W? It's basically like a length of the dimer. You can think of it as a present length of a dimer. And this length, whenever there's a strain in the flow, that means this S is the symmetric part of the velocity gradient. Whenever there's a strain, it gets stretched. And whenever there's a vorticity, the anti-symmetric part of the velocity gradient, it gets rotated. So that is what the flow coupling is. And there's one more flow coupling term, which we'll come to at the end. And if it's left to itself, like suppose there was no flow, this dimer will just go to W equal to zero. It will just collapse on itself and it won't do anything. Its activity will just die. So the length of this dimer is a kind of contribution to its activity. And there is this important quantity alpha, which we'll talk about, which is how much it responds to a given strain. And like if it gets easily stretched out by strain, then W can always be much bigger. So alpha kind of denotes activity for us. The bigger the alpha is, the more far away from zero the W is. That's what we have. And uh, now we can plug this back into that equation. Okay. And then we write down the final equation just by eliminating W. And you get something very, very close to the Maxi Riley equation, where you supposed to have no mass, you got something like an effective mass, which is the response time of this dimer divided by some flow coupling para forcing parameter mu. So you actually have a, uh, an inertia-like equation out of this. So that is basically the explanation for how active particles with stokes equal to zero can create caustics. Okay, and uh, these all terms in this, we're going to set the noise always to zero. And this term is a orientation term, which we'll come to later. But right now for the next few slides, we're going to set L equal to zero and eta is always going to be equal to zero. And so this is the final equation we have. And again, this term is very nonlinear for exactly the same reason, because U is a function of X. U is not independent of X. Okay, so this is just, I mean, no need to look at each term and get it all. There's no way, but uh, basically just go by the color. So like uh, where the mass of the particle was, now there is this effective mass. So you get a Maxi Riley like term there. There's another Maxi Riley like term coming from the external force, which is gravity, for example, for a raindrop. And uh, you have fluid acceleration, which is very similar to this. You have this thing, we uh, call this the effective faxon term, but this actually is called the faxon correction in Maxi Riley, and uh, which is here. So this term and that term are very, very similar in appearance, although they came from completely different sources. And this is the Stokes drag, effective Stokes drag term that we've been talking about. So this was the important term in our baby Maxi Riley. There were some other terms in the Maxi Riley which are missing here, thank goodness. Okay, so what the equation that we wrote down is actually nothing but a well-known equation, which is called uh, the active einstein ullenbeck equation. So this is just the same equation as in that paper, for example. And it can be written in this modified form with a tau, which is now, uh, the tau is now an effective time, which is basically this whole thing. One over this whole thing is the effective time. And the inertial particle, remember we had this, we'd scaled it out nicely and we got this universal equations, right? Now for active particles, we get something very similar except it's not completely parameter free or something. There is still the activity parameter alpha and this orientation uh, uh, parameter lambda. So these two parameters are there, but the length scales got removed just like before. We use the exact same length scale. Okay, so this is now the equation for active dose, A-O-U-P. 
And now again, we're asking the same question. Here was a particle initially at R0. It moved to a new place where it dashed against another particle. And that place was called the R caustics. So we are asking the exact same question. And this blue guy is just the vortex. And so like, look at these comparisons. You remember how the uh, center of the whole thing got evacuated very fast in the inertial case. So this is just shown at a typical time. This is the initial time we start out with the you know, homogeneous distribution of particles. With the active particles, you see there's some difference. Like, you know, there are two or three different peaks where they, uh, you know, where the particles congregate and they, with time, like this picture actually doesn't change. At very large time, it just reaches some kind of steady state and it stays there. That's the difference between an inertial particle and an active particle. And in an inertial particle, we saw they get centrifuged out in a Fermat spiral. Very, very slowly, but they're always, always centrifuging out. In this case, there is actually a steady state solution where all these active particles become effective tracers and they start moving with the flow wherever they are. So, is there limit cycle in that one? Who's speaking? Uh, uh, yeah, this is like some trivial limit cycle. So like basically all particles starting from a particular place will, so like in other words, this place where, you know, particles from a variety of radii come there and they all congregate there. So this you can think of as an attracting limit cycle. But uh, uh, I mean, it's good you ask this because in some cases, like when we have more than one vortex, we can actually have these limit cycles going through bifurcations and going all the way to chaos. That's not the topic of today's lecture. Here, the idea was to just show how active particles can do caustics. So yeah, you started out with the uniform number density as a function of R given by that. And after a certain time, the inertial particles went like this. So this is what it looked like. And this thing is moving out constantly, whereas the active particles reached a steady state with a non-monotonic kind of number density. So particles congregate. And this is very good news for those uh, uh, animals which want to socialize. So they just have to be lucky enough to be in the vicinity of a vortex. OK, and you can write nice things about the caustics. You can write scalings. That's not something we'll go into now. But if you're interested, you can look at it. It's many things you can do analytically with this stuff. So, uh, so again, we do a singular perturbation analysis like we did in the other case, but I'm not showing it to you. All I will tell you is that the outer solution is not there. It basically reaches a steady state and the inner solution is very similar to before and we keep getting caustics. And so here is the complete solution. This is blue line is for the inertial particles, which you saw before. And this is AOUP of a particular high activity. So this also behaves very much like an inertial particle under certain conditions. So it can form caustics in all of these. And this thing was created by taking all kinds of random initial conditions. These all were, you know, some classes of initial conditions which gave power law behavior. But here we took all kinds of random initial conditions and we asked like, when can you get caustics? So remember we got a constant R critical here in the case of uh, the uh, inertial particles. Now you get this kind of behavior as a function of activity alpha. Now note that whenever alpha is zero also, you have some caustics forming and that's because the W is not zero when you started with. So W is very quickly relaxing to zero, but it can create caustics even without alpha for short times. So that's what is happening here. And that's why you have two different kinds of behavior. And uh, here is a simulation which we did in 2D turbulence. So we put, now we added this factor beta, earlier it was U plus W, but just we wanted to increase the activity into the flow and see what it brings. And this is what you get for very low activity. Already you see lots of caustics here. And for moderate activity, you see lots and lots of caustics. And for very, very high activity, you do not get caustics. And that, I mean, basically, you know, you do get caustics, but it again, like, uh, goes into a uniform distribution. You don't get these singular features which remain. 
I should have made that clear. So this is what it is with increased activity. And uh, the exact same simulation we did with inertial particles. And you see, like, as you increase Stokes number, Stokes number around one gives you this kind of maximal clustering. And then when Stokes number goes higher, the clustering starts vanishing. So this is very, very similar to inertial particles. So here too, you see an analogy. And these are now caustics with a difference, as we call it. Because as I told you, so this is different levels of activity and the initial radius and the caustics radius. This is exactly the graph you saw earlier for the inertial particle, but it's very different because for very, very small activity, it goes like this. And then for large activity, it goes the other way. So like uh, in between for moderate levels of activity, there's actually no uh, caustic. So this was for random initial conditions and that is for continuous initial conditions where we've solved the Z equation. So Rajeshi wrote down a Z equation for this as well and did it. And there's a regime here where there's no caustics. So that's what this graph is telling you. And this thing, like wherever you take a particle, you see that the particle reaches a constant radius. So particles go somewhere and then they reach a constant radius. They become tracer particles and they move round and round. That's why we call it caustics with a difference. So like I'll very quickly talk about another flow, which I won't even describe too much, but just to show you that everything we showed is not very specific to AOUP. It also happens to other things. And this is called an active Brownian particle where the major difference is that the W doesn't relax to zero, but it relaxes to a constant. And this uh, vector P, which is actually dependent on W, takes care of it. It's a nonlinear uh, equation. So W will reach a constant. And there are various things like the level of activity, the polar alignability. So this is one thing, the last thing I want to tell you about. We neglected this term, which looked like the Faxon correction in the Maxi Riley. So this thing, the polar alignability is as follows. So suppose a particle like this particle is like a dimer, right? So it has a length. And now like when it's in a shear flow, so suppose flow is fast there and slow here, it will align along the principal axis, namely at 45 degrees, right? So it's going to align in this axis. And so like if there's a, uh, so this thing, and that alignment is going to do something to it. So in particular, like, if, if the flow is, suppose you have a parabolic flow, something where the shear is not constant. So any variation in the shear, you're going to see some interesting things, which is that this thing, which was like that for uh, one sign of shear will be like this for the other sign of shear. And suppose it's now a polar particle, it will try to go to the place where there's zero shear and move along it. So this term will do something to it to tell it where to go in the flow. So this is like called a polar alignability. Okay, and uh, that's it appears only when there's a del square u, namely a shear which is not constant. And again, we're throwing away the noise. So these are three movies for increased activity. The movies are very similar to what you got in the other AOUP. So this is for small level of activity. There I showed you just the still pictures, but you get the general idea. And this is moderate activity. And this is extremely high activity. So we saw that there is a, I mean, at order one activity, it's going to cluster a lot. And uh, this shows us like where the particles go. So, the black dots in this thing are particles, and this picture is similar in AOUP or ABP. The black dots are particles, and if you look at this zoomed in part, you'll see that wherever grad V is very, very high, like something into 10 to the power minus 3, wherever it's very, very high, you will get the particles clustering close to that. So it preferentially samples those regions. Secondly, uh, like in terms of the Okubo wise parameter. So this is the vorticity uh, magnitude squared minus the strain magnitude squared. So wherever W is a positive number, you have more vertical uh, situation and wherever you have 
uh, W being a negative number, the strain is dominant. And in a normal flow, it will be very close to this low activity case. So in, in the general flow, you're very likely to have very high vortical regions compared to strain regions. This is just a property of turbulence. It's not to do with the particles. So this thing, the outer curve just tells you about a basic property of turbulence. Whereas as you increase the activity, so you take it to this moderate value 1.95, it went like this. In other words, it's sampling the vertical regions less. In particular, it's left the regions of extremely high vorticity. It's evacuated from there. So all that this is showing is that uh, whatever we argued about for a single vortex analytically is also true in a proper simulation. So it left that thing. And as you increase the activity again, it started sampling the flow everywhere again. So this is the basic message here. That's all that it's telling you. And this thing is going to tell me about this, um, you know, polarizability parameter that I described. So we'll watch a couple of movies. So this red thing is high polarizability. This black thing is zero. And this minus is in the other direction. We are we, uh, aligning them in the upside down direction against the shear. So we'll watch just these movies. So this is when it's zero, this movie you saw before. And this is when it's very highly polarized. It's even more spectacularly caustic. -y. That's what this thing is. So as you increase this polarizability, you're increasing the levels of um, the, the amount of caustics being formed or the strength of the caustics. And here is a negative one, which also does qualitatively the same thing. Oops, not again. Okay, so before I finish, I just wanted to take one minute to talk about the complete Maxi Riley equation, which describes the unsteady Stokes flow in a sphere. I just want to give this slide as an advertisement. So we considered the Maxi Riley equation up to here till now, and that in our group we call the baby Maxi Riley. But the grown up Maxi Riley has this term called the Bassett. Business history. It's the drag on a particle where the particle remembers all its past. It remembers like where it was, I mean, what its acceleration was long ago and what the part, uh, flow, flow's acceleration was there. And in order to calculate this one little dynamics of one tiny particle, you need to keep integrating from zero time to now for every particle at every time step. So like in the next time step, again, I have to start from zero because this term, the kernel here is like that. So this looks like a very, very complicated term and people throw away this and use baby Maxi Riley, although they actually may or may not have a right to do that. And so we studied this in particular, Divya, who's going to graduate soon has studied this. And she's done some amazing work where she can include this and with brilliant ideas from Vishal. Oops, brilliant ideas from Vishal and also Ganga. And what she's done is she's found a way to solve this thing accurately with constant storage, constant memory requirements. So the memory requirements don't keep increasing when you have to remember all your past. So that's a special method and a specially designed Range Kutta scheme because this thing, you know, uh, scales in powers of one over square root t uh, and powers of square root t. So if you write the standard Range Kutta, you'll flunk out. So she's got this amazing method, which is way, way fast, and it can do Bassett history also for particles. So this is, and incidentally, she's looking for a postdoctoral position. So let me know if you have, or let her know. And these are basically the conclusions. I talked about all of this, so I'll just stop here. Thanks for your attention. Questions? Uh, thanks a lot for the talk, Rama. So I was curious, what do you think would, uh, I mean, change here uh, in the very high particle density limits? I mean, they can also start killing of vortices or, uh, I mean, the, uh, with their drag and so on. Yeah. So how do we, I mean, what the way forward for? Yeah, you're quite right. Like, we just don't know what's going to happen in the uh, limit where they're interacting with each other. Uh, but uh, one thing we know is that 
there's going to be more clustering when there's interaction, interparticle interaction. So uh, always interparticle interaction in the mediated by hydrodynamics encourages clustering. Most more often than not, there are situations where it does not encourage, especially when it's not spherical, the particle, but in spherical particles, you're going to encourage clustering. So you're quite right that after a while, like right now, we pretended, I should have said this to everybody right in the beginning, that we pretended that this flow is so powerful, it's a cloud, it's an ocean, and these little bacteria or these little droplets cannot affect the flow, only the flow can affect them. And that's called one-way coupling. But what Siddhartha is talking about is four-way coupling, where particles can interact with each other, they're in, you know, densish clusters, and then they can affect the flow. And in fact, if many of them join together, they may drag the vortex and kill it off as well. So yeah, these are things to be studied. Especially in snow avalanches, it will be a fun thing to study. The flows that were simulated were homogeneous and isotropic, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you expect anything special when you start putting shear or something? Yes. In fact, we do expect something special. We've started looking at this, and that's because of the following. So uh, if I'm getting this right, the homogeneous isotropic turbulence has this thing where this thing is R and this is Q, or is it the other way around? It's this. So this is the Okubo-wise parameter, and this is the determinant parameter. And uh, 3D turbulence lives like this, homogeneous isotropic. And uh, um, shear turbulence is not going to. So it's going to explore you know, regimes like this, different regimes. And the interesting thing is we find a lot of caustics in this region. So that remains to be explored. It's just a preliminary thinking thing right now. Any more questions? So let's thank uh, Professor Rama for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.